Hi everybody and welcome back to Great Academy's uh, Home Economics Lecture. Um, today we're looking at uh, Core 1, Food Studies and Chapter 2, Diet and Health, and this is our third lecture um, on this particular chapter. You'll remember the other two were energy and we looked at specific dietary requirements and I reminded you to fill out your worksheets before you actually looked at this particular lecture as well. So what we're looking at, we're looking at dietary deficiencies and excesses. And these are just some of the images that are there with regard to having too much or too little of a particular nutrient um, in the body and what the impact it can have on us. So first and foremost, most, what is a dietary deficiency? Well, deficiency of anything is not having enough, basically. So if you have a diet deficient in many essential nutrients, this can lead to different diseases, uh, such as scurvy, which is due to lack of vitamin C, osteoporosis which is lack of calcium and vitamin D. Some of the diseases now are very rare in Western society such as scurvy and rickets although we have seen a resurgence of rickets in recent years and hence uh, public health guidelines have been to actually um, increase our vitamin D intake because we're not getting enough from our diet or from the sun. Too many diseases uh, such as osteoporosis and anemia which is due to lack of iron are on the increase and research uh, has um, identified links between vitamin and mineral absorption or absorption. So calcium and vitamin D, iron and vitamin C, and vitamins for nutrient metabolism would be our B group vitamins. And you'll remember all of those uh, from uh, chapter one. So you can see here we're repeating a lot of the information that we had in chapter one with regard to how relevant it is in other parts of our diet. So when we look at our dietary excesses then, and this is due to I was having too much of something. And it's a recent phenomenon and one which is causing thousands of deaths in the developed world each year. And diseases that are associated with dietary extremes include bowel disease, coronary heart disease, osteoporosis, diabetes and dental decay. So all of these are really due to excesses within the diet. And they're, they're, they're a recent phenomenon and there are parts of the world, in fact, um, who don't have a high incidence of these particular diseases. But here in the wet, many parts of the Western world, we have a very, very high incidence of bowel disease, coronary heart disease, etc. So when we look at the first one there, we're looking at the bowel disorders. And the increase in bowel disorders is due to the reduced fibre intake in the diet, which is linked to the increased refined carbohydrate content of our everyday diet. So what does that mean? It basically means that we are having a lot of our food, which is processed, which means that the fibre element or component of the food has been removed. And that would be things like, um, let's say, the skin on our potatoes. That would be something that would provide us with fibre. We look at our bread. Um, white or then we have our wholemeal uh, variety, same with our rice and our pasta. So the images that you're seeing here in front of you um, is the diverticular disease and we'll look at that in a minute when we look at the different types of bowel diseases and you can see the lumps that are there within the actual um, intestine itself and they are the ones that cause the problem because it's in here that food gets lodged and therefore can cause uh, pain and can sometimes erupt. So colon cancer, first of all, um, is the, the first symptoms of that can be uh, blood loss through the colon. It's often due to lack of uh, high fibre food, uh, reduced intake of fruit and vegetables and a diet high in fatty foods. So increasing our fruit and vegetables or just following what the food pyramid says and what the guidelines are with regard to healthy eating and having a uh, choosing, you know, if you're out for a sandwich or you're out for, for a meal or anything, that you choose the whole meal variety. Um, that's a really good decision to make and it's one that's very easy to implement in your own diet. Irritable bowel syndrome then, or IBS, um, is extremely painful and it's when you have muscle cramps in the lower abdomen. Uh, you often can have a feeling of being bloated as well. Um, you can go between having diarrhea and constipation um, and then also it's due to lack of high fiber food basically some people will have IBS and it can be stress related so only when they're feeling stressed do they actually have the symptoms of the IBS which are extremely painful. 
So our next one then is diverticular disease, which is the image we just spoke about there a while ago. And um, pressure exerted on the intestinal wall when constipated can create those small pockets that we saw. Uh, and these pockets become filled with food and bacteria then will grow in there and that then will cause pain. These pockets basically become swollen and they cause immense pain for the, su for the sufferer. Um, and again, lack of fiber in the diet and lack of fluids in the daily diet. Our water, remember we spoke about the two liters of water before, that's really important because that helps to keep our digestive system um, moving as well. When we look at hemorrhoids then, um, hemorrhoids are basically where the veins in the anus and the rectum become swollen and they can become itchy and there can be blood, blood loss. Now, often they will develop during pregnancy. They develop during pregnancy because of the extra weight and the carrying around of that weight. Um, so sometimes the hemorrhoids develop during pregnancy, but then they will go then again after the pregnancy. Again, high fiber diet prevents it and avoid excess exertion when excreting the feces. Because if you have ex excess exertion, when you're actually um, going to the to the toilet that can end up causing um it them to burst and that that's where you can have the blood loss okay so there are hemorrhoids and then lastly constipation and this is probably the most common bowel disorder and it's a result of a low fiber diet and probably everybody at some stage will suffer from constipation and it's really when you have irregular bowel movements and you know when they can be hard and they can be difficult to excrete um, you should have uh, between 25 and 30 grams of fiber a day. And sometimes that's really easy to achieve, actually, because if you have a bowl of porridge or two Weetabix or some um, shreddies in the morning, that can actually give you the majority of your fiber for the day. And when we talk about fiber, and we'll see this in our next section, it's non-starch polysaccharide. It's a non-starch polysaccharide. So that's constipation and there are bowel disorders. What do you need to know for the exam for those? You would need to know the five different ones, what are the symptoms of it, and what can you do um, to eradicate or to reduce the pain. Um, I suppose, how are we going to increase the fiber um, in our diet? Um, it's very easy. Use whole grain, wholemeal variety, the flour, bread, pasta, rice, cereal, etc. Increase your fruit and vegetable and your pulse intake. Um, you know, with uh, vegetables and with fruit, eat the actual skins as much as you can because they're really good for fiber. Drink your eight glasses of water a day or more if you can. And increase exercise. Exercise is really important for moving the food through your intestine. Because the more exercise you do, um, the easier it is for the food to move through your intestine. So exercise is really important too uh, for that particular piece. So our advantages, well, I think after looking at some of the issues that arise because of a low fibre diet, it's very easy to see how we could have the, the advantages. So it's low in fat. It will give you a feeling of fullness. Um, movement of food through the intestines, therefore preventing many of those diseases we spoke about. And high fibre diet can also assist at lowering blood cholesterol and it reduces the possibility of coronary heart disease. So many of the excesses that we're going to look at now later on in the lecture, actually having a high fiber diet can help with reduction of those. So when we move on then to look at osteoporosis, and osteoporosis is a very common bone disorder in the adults. And this very base, simple graphic actually can show you the difference between um, our strong bones and our weaker bones in osteoporosis. And what I need you to look at here in these two diagrams is actually the size of the holes. Now, this is only diagrammatic representation, obviously. But basically, you can see there that the larger the holes are for the osteoporosis, then obviously the weaker the bones are going to be compared to the more structured piece um, where you have it labeled strong bone. So the bones will become thin and porous, resulting in the bone being fragile and brittle, which means they're easily broken. So often people who have osteoporosis can end up having many fractures, you know, if they fall over, um, you know, somebody else might fall over and be bruised, they could fall over and they could fracture a bone. Sufficient vitamin D and calcium will help prevent osteoporosis. And that's something that you can do from a very early age. In fact, you know, your ideal bone mass is achieved between the ages of about 25 and 35. So what does that mean? It means that your the calcium that you're taking into your diet and your vitamin D at that point is helping to build up the stores for your bones for later on in life uh, when osteoporosis could become an issue. Achieving 
bone mass can significantly reduce the risk of osteoporosis in later life. So there are some factors which increase the risk of developing osteoporosis. Really important that you know these. This can come up in your section A or section B question. So knowing these five points is really important. So gender. Females are more likely to develop osteoporosis. Um, and that's generally, that's really linked into hormonal and age and postmenopausal women due to the lack of the female hormone estrogen. So estrogen will actually help your bones maintain calcium, but after the menopause, uh, estrogen levels drop in females and therefore they no longer have that capacity um, with regard to calcium. Family, it can be hereditary. If other family members have suffered from osteoporosis, there is a greater um, link there between another person in the family uh, developing it. Diet, inadequate intake of calcium and vitamin D, which we've already spoken about. And again, lack of exercise can contribute to the weakening of the bone. And particularly, again, around that middle age, it's really important to have that those weight-bearing exercise, as well as the aerobic, obviously. But the weight-bearing exercises are really good for the bones. Um, it kind of breaks them down and builds them back up stronger again. So the symptoms of osteoporosis are your brittle and fragile bones, which are going to break easily. Um, again, fracture of bones, especially the hips. Um, again, if you fall over or just with general wear and tear, often people can suffer from uh, neck and back pain and loss of height because um, people generally can be have rounded shoulders, maybe a curved or a humped back, and that can be due to osteoporosis and uh, the bone structures um, shortening. So they're very, very specific symptoms to osteoporosis, so really important that you know them and that you can expand on each one. The next section then when we look at, you know, how are we going to reduce the risk? Now, we've probably already looked at this because we know that if we have enough calcium and enough vitamin D, you know, especially during that age 25 onwards, you know, and I know that might seem a long way away, but when you get to that age and that 10 year period, you know, making sure that your diet is sufficient um, in these foods. Not smoking will also help and keeping alcohol to a minimum um, when you are of that age. Women after the menopause um, should use HRT, which is a hormone replacement therapy to compensate for estrogen loss. OK, and, you know, they should use it. But obviously, all of that would be in consultation with their uh, GP. And again, exercising regularly, particularly for those weight bearing exercises. So our next one then is obesity. And if you remember back to our last lecture in part two of this, we spoke about um, some of the um, issues around eating with adolescents and obesity was one of the ones we looked at. And it basically destroy, describes a person who is 20% above his or her recommended weight. And obesity is a result of lifestyle choices. Those habits need to be changed if a person is going to lose weight. So often their obesity is due to an unhealthy diet and lack of exercise. And unfortunately, in the Western world, we have seen a huge increase in the number of people who are obese. As you know, in Ireland, we have one in four children now who would be classified as overweight or obese. So, again, we know that this is happening and there's more girls than boys and often it is due to that sedentary lifestyle, the games, not going out to play, etc. Now, a healthy weight from Ireland was an obesity policy and action plan that was established and that's there to look at that plan from 2015 to 2025. And there's 60 specific actions and they include new health eating guidelines, legislation on calorie posting. And you might even notice many restaurants and takeouts don't actually give you the calorie content um, of a specific food before you even purchase it. The development of a nutrition policy and the prioritization of obesity service in the health service. So this is a really important document in trying to reduce obesity in Ireland. So how does a person become obese? Um, when you're basically your calorie intake is greater than your calorie output. So you're taking in more than you're actually needing for that energy piece that we looked at in part one of this chapter. Lack of exercise. If you're exercising, then obviously you're using up energy. So therefore you're using those calories. If you have a sedentary lifestyle, if you sit at a desk all day, if you then drive home and then you sit in front of the TV for the evening or a computer or a gaming console. Well, you've had no exercise really for that day and therefore your diet needs to reflect that. The increase in convenience foods and fast foods is a dietary option. You know, I suppose with our lifestyles 
being so busy, often the convenient foods and the fast foods are a lot easier than sometimes uh, preparing food uh, from scratch. Increase in foods high in saturated fat and sugar. And we see a lot of that in the convenience food sector and in our fast food sector. Boredom or depression can cause a person to comfort eat. Uh, many people can be called what they'd say they're emotional eaters and that, you know, if they're feeling stressed or if they're feeling sad or upset or depressed, they can actually comfort eat um, during that time. And, and some medication or hormonal balance can also cause weight gain. One of those would be the thyroid gland. In fact, the thyroid gland produces thyroxine, uh, which is involved with our metabolism. And if there is an issue with that, that can uh, cause us to weight to gain weight, but also can cause us to lose weight. So um, that's just to be aware of that fact. So the dangers of being obese, then it can ca cause a whole load of health problems for a person. Um, and, you know, even if a person is really young, when they are obese, you know, it's very important that they lose that weight because otherwise they can have lifelong um, issues with their health. So heart disease due to buildup of cholesterol in the artery walls, and we will look at that. But in essence, what it means is that our artery walls become blocked and our, our the blood can't be pumped through it. Or when it is pumped through it, it's putting an awful lot of pressure on the heart. High blood pressure. People who are obese will often have high blood pressure. And high blood pressure in itself can cause strokes and can cause other issues as well. Um, high cholesterol levels contribute to um, a, all of the above due to their low density lipoproteins. Um, often I try to remember, and we look at uh, diabetes in a, in a while, but when you're thinking of those low density lipoproteins, I often think of the L and L for lousy, so therefore they're not really very good for me uh, because sometimes students get mixed up. Um, with the low density lipoproteins and therefore can think that they're the good ones when in fact it is the opposite. So the L for the lousy ones and HDL is high density lipoproteins. So they're the good ones. OK, they're high. They're good. And um, they're, you know, they're the ones that you need to be trying to get into your diet. And also um, a huge number of people who are obese will suffer from type 2 um, diabetes, which is non-insulin dependent uh, diabetes mellitus, but often happens in people over 50. But we are seeing really that it's younger and younger people, as in people in their late teens, early 20s, are now developing this type of diabetes, which maybe 40 years ago would have been something you would have only seen in people over the age of 50. So there's huge um, life-threatening um, illnesses there uh, when you are actually obese. So again, type 2 diabetes accounts for 80% um, and 90% of those are actually obese. Gallstones are also there and that's from the gallbladder. And again, that's due to high cholesterol levels and they can form the gallstones and they're very painful. Arthritis, you have extreme pain in your back and your leg joints due to excess weight. Um, infertility and difficult childbirth due to extra weight and then psychological problems, low self-esteem, um, you know, poor self-confidence and things like that are often can be due to a person's own uh, perception of themselves. So there really is a huge number of issues associated with obesity. So it's actually really important that you're familiar with all of them and that you're able to attribute the reason why they are like that when you're answering your exam question. So how to overcome it and the main way is to rectify your energy balance. You know, like we've said already, it's you're taking in too much food for the amount of energy you're putting out. So this can be achieved by increasing exercise to 45 minute sessions most days of the week. So if you're able to do that, um, then you are really changing the balance of your diet and reducing high fat and calorie laden food. So any sugary food, refined or processed food, fast food, if they're all eliminated from your diet and you're using fresh food, um, you're preparing your own meals, you know, your breakfast is maybe a boiled egg, a poached egg, it could be cereal, it could be like porridge or something like that, you know, and you have a very specific way of eating, then it's very easy actually to reduce that fat content and those calorie laden food with a few simple tweaks and changes. And obviously, you know, for any diet, you always need to discuss it with your GP um, to make sure that it's safe for you. So I'm not actually going to go through each of these because we've already spoken at length about them. Um, I suppose one of the key things there would be is the second one there where it says a slow weekly weight loss is far more efficient. So one to two pounds a week is far better 
than actually um, a big weight loss because the chances are and research would tell us that people who would lose more than that will actually put it back on again. Um, and, you know, just as a point, three and a half thousand calories is one pound, basically. So that's what you're looking at reducing in the week. So the coronary heart disease, now we spoke about this uh, during the, we were looking at obesity. But you can see it's a major health problem in Ireland and in many Western countries, in fact. It's linked to the increased content of saturated fatty acids in the diet and reduced activity. So if you can see those two arteries there, you have the normal artery. And then in the narrowing of the artery, you can see that yellow buildup. And that's the lipid buildup, basically, in the actual artery. And what happens is that eventually that artery could potentially become totally blocked or only have a tiny, tiny uh, way for the blood to come through. Because remember, that's what our arteries are there for, to carry the blood around the body. So if we look at um, how well it develops, then the walls of the artery, which we've looked at there, become narrow and they build up with the LDL. Remember the low density lipoprotein. And this will basically block the flow of blood to the heart. And this blockage or hardening of the arteries is called arterial cirrhosis. So this is, you know, a very dangerous thing to happen without people knowing about it, uh, because it can lead, obviously, to the the uh, coronary heart disease and it can lead to a heart attack. So if we look at this here, you can see how the blood flow is blocked. Right, so the build up of the plaque there in the arteries and then the blood flow. So what's happening there is that the blood isn't able to come through. This can result in pain, lack of oxygen, and a heart attack um, for for somebody. All right, so again, these are just showing you, again, the different stages and the progression towards the heart attack. So in the first one, you'll see, you know, there's a bit of blockage. Second one, the third one, and then by the fourth one, we're really looking at a very, very serious case um, leading towards the heart attack. So it will develop gradually, but can have very serious consequences, as we know. Angina, first of all, is a shortness of breath. You get extreme chest pain and it can be caused by emotional stress as well. So and uh, angina will be medicated. So if somebody is suffering from angina, they can have medication for it. A heart attack then is where a clot will block the arteries. So this prevents the blood flow and the oxygen getting to the heart. And again, that can come on very, very suddenly on somebody. And then you have unexpected death due to a heart attack. Um, and again, that can just happen really, really suddenly for somebody um, without them actually realizing that their arteries were blocked um, and that they had issues with regard to it. So sometimes those warnings, you know, that shortness of breath, the chest pain can be indi early indicators for somebody and um, that there might be issues with their heart. So it's always worth getting that checked out. Now, sudden cardiac death. Uh, this is the death that occurs due to coronary heart disease in late middle age onwards. However, in recent years, we've had a number of young adults have died and the death just occurs within maybe one hour of the onset of the symptoms. We've often seen it in sports fields with young people, um, you know, sudden out playing a match or whatever, suddenly getting a heart attack. And that's called sudden cardiac death. And there's a lot of research going on at the moment with regard to that and how it occurs. And is there any way of knowing um, prior to it um, happening? So what are the, who are the risk factors? Now, again, section A, section B question. You need to be able to expand on each of those. So make sure that you can write a sentence or two about each of these and why. So men over 45, women over 55, genetics. Family history of coronary heart disease is a huge risk factor, actually. And if there is that risk factor in the family, it's important, in fact, that, um, you know, children or siblings, that they get themselves checked out. High cholesterol level and high blood pressure. Getting your blood pressure checked regularly, getting your cholesterol levels checked and being medicated for both of them if needed. Ideally, through your diet, you can reduce both and through exercise, you can actually reduce both levels. Having no exercise um, is a huge risk factor as well. Smoking and excess alcohol consumption is a big risk factor as well. Stress can cause heart um, disease and our family circumstances. And if you suffer from obesity or diabetes or and diabetes, you are at a greater risk of developing coronary heart disease. So again, the risk factors associated with coronary heart disease. Now, so the lifestyle and dietary changes, and in the exam, if you're asked this question, 
please, and we will look at this again when we when we analyze exam questions but make sure you answer both lifestyle and dietary because if you only answer one you will be deducted marks for omitting the other one so what's the lifestyle one the lifestyle one is about how we go about our day so exercise regularly avoid smoking avoid alcohol reduce your weight if you're overweight reduce your stress level if you're in a stressful work environment or a stressful home environment you know you need to manage that and sometimes through meditation exercise can be a great one to reduce stress levels so then our dietary one then the dietary obviously is key here it's about what we're eating what we're taking into our diet what we're eating so reduce your salt and saturated fat intake increase your use of polyunsaturated fats which will help uh, lower your ldl remember your um density protein that remember the ones that aren't so good for you increase your fiber intake as it helps to lower your ldl avoid refined carbohydrates especially sugar you know omit it um use sweeteners if you if you do like to have a little bit of sugar or that sweetness in your food eat low fat products such as milk and cheese um with milk make sure it's the super or the um milk variety where there's the added vitamins and minerals to it but the fat content is lower and then increase your intake of fruit and uh, vegetables. So again, the lifestyle dietary changes, make sure that you can differentiate between them. And they're all key to ensuring um, and that helping somebody to reduce their risk of heart disease. So cholesterol then, cholesterol is, we produce cholesterol in our body. It's actually produced in the liver and it's acquired from saturated fat in the diet and we actually need it. But sometimes with the amount of cholesterol that people have and some of the media and press attention there, it can seem that all cholesterol is bad, but that's actually not the case. So we have our LDL, remember, which was our bad or a lousy one. And then we had our good one, which is our HDL, right? And you can see there again, your artery and you can see there the buildup of the cholesterol in the artery, which will result in you not having your blood flowing um, through your artery. So cholesterol, we need it in the body to make new cells. It's production of hormones uh, for growth and reproduction. It's a vital component of our bile salts uh, to transport fat around the body and the blood. And the cholesterol is attached to some protein creating our lipoprotein. So there you can see these are the reasons why we need cholesterol in the diet. However, it's the type of cholesterol which is really important, right? So we need the HDL one, it's the LDL one, which we don't need in our diet, and that's the risk one. So as we look at our, the types again, like I've just said, the low density lipoprotein, which is the LDL, dangerous buildup in the arteries, saturated fat, high density lipoprotein will eliminate excess cholesterol uh, from the blood, therefore preventing a buildup of arteries. So that's a very common question for section A, to differentiate between LDL and HDL, know know what both of them do in the body and know which one we need and which one we don't need so what are the guidelines then how are you going to do that so dietary guidelines here now again reduce your intake of foods high in cholesterol eggs and liver um but again if you don't have high cholesterol then you know the eggs aren't an issue but they are an issue if you do have high uh, cholesterol Reduce your intake of saturated fats, so butter, cheese, red meat, etc., because it's the saturated fats of the issue. Increase your intake of polyunsaturated fatty acids, and you'll remember those now from chapter one when we were looking at lipids. So here we see it again. Polyunsaturated fatty acids counteract the hardening effect on the artery. And then have your cholesterol levels monitored. That's really key. If you have been identified with having um, raised cholesterol levels, make sure that you return to your GP for your blood test to make sure that your levels um, are stabilizing and that they haven't increased. So our next one then that we're looking at is diabetes mellitus. And this is caused by the inability of the pancreas to produce insulin or um, insulin is produced is not, you can't actually use it, okay? So you will see that there, and that's just a diagram there of the pancreas, and you may be familiar from that, with that if you're doing biology as well. So why do we need insulin? Insulin, we need it in the body to control our blood sugar, our glucose levels, that can be used for the production of energy. However, diabetes has increased in recent years due to high fat diet and inactive lifestyles. So there are the two types of diabetes, and here we are referring to when it's due to diet and lifestyle choices and inactive lifestyle choices, I suppose I should say, we're looking at type 2. 
So again, type 1 is insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, and the pancreas doesn't produce insulin. And it's controlled by injections of insulin, and it develops mainly in young children and adolescents. So generally, people will know from a very young age if they have uh, type 1 diabetes. It can often be hereditary, and it will require insulin injections or oral medications. Um, obviously, it, it involves checking uh, your blood sugar levels, and it also maintains you know, how, how you eat and having, you know, you can't go for long periods without actually eating. So that's type one and that generally develops earlier on in somebody's life. Type two then is the non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus and the insulin produced is useless to the body. So the insulin is produced, but it's, it's not any good. So we can't use it. Overweight adults, often can suffer from it. You can generally control it by the diet. And um, if you are able to manage your diet, you often will end up, you know, reducing it in fact, or in some cases they've eliminated it from their um from their diet. Number of younger people, 25 to 45, developing it is increasing, healthy eating and avoiding high sugar food and exercising. So again, guys, I'm just going to bring you back because this particular lecture is a little bit longer, is to make sure you're doing your worksheet and you are able to differentiate between all the different uh, things that we've spoken about here today. So your symptoms include thirst, frequent urination, weight loss, tiredness and fatigue, blood, uh, sorry, blurred vision, potential to develop with glaucoma, which is um, an eye disease, kidney failure, heart disease, um, if it's left untreated. Um, so that's type 2 diabetes. Um, and again, it is important to follow dietary guidelines around that because you can eliminate it. So refined sugar products, eat fruit which has a low sugar content. Because while we talk about in our food pyramid eating fruit, there are certain fruits that would be high in sugar, let's say grapes or something like that. Uh, bananas, which wouldn't be very good um, if you type 2 uh, diabetes. Increase your intake of high fiber foods. Reduce your saturated fats to reduce the risk of coronary heart disease and stroke. Eat three regular meals a day that will stabilize your blood sugar levels and therefore that should prevent any other symptoms happening. And eat starch-based carbohydrates foods for slow energy release. And you'll remember those from chapter one and we'll also be looking at them again in the next few lectures when we look at food commodities. So then we have hypo and hyperglycemia. So a hypoglycemia is low blood sugar and too much insulin in the body. If you have symptoms of that, you're feeling unwell, there's perspiration, there's hunger, there's irritability. Hyperglycemia is high blood sugar, not enough insulin in the body. Often that can be vomiting, high temperature, uh, heavy breathing, and then you can end up in a diabetic coma. Um, which could result in death. So it's really the blood sugar levels, as you can see here, you know, if it's too low, you have some symptoms. If it's too high, you have more serious ones. So testing and checking in your blood is really important. So again, when we look back at each of those, the other one there that we haven't actually looked at is the um, dental decay. All right. And again, you would be looking at the reasons why for dental decay and the development of plaque and sugar, um, uh, brushing your teeth, uh, changing tube brushes and things like that and will be part of that. So really what you need to do here is you need to, in your worksheet, take the count of the specific requirements for each group. Okay, so that's from all three lectures now. And use the menu template that, that you have in your worksheet and create a menu and give your reasons why. So for instance, if you're taking, let's say if we take somebody who has, um, let's say coronary heart disease, Right, so when you're giving their uh, meal for their dinner of the day, you might take um, chicken stir fry with rice. Why are you doing that? Because it ha it's low in fat, um, it has protein in the form of the chicken, it has uh, whole, use whole grain rice, obviously, so you're giving it the fiber. You have your vitamins and your minerals in your onions and your mushrooms and your peppers, etc. So you need to be able to explain why you are choosing each of those. So that's a little bit of work. So you're probably best to divide it up over a number of days rather than trying to do it all together. So again, when we look at our exam analysis, um, I've just taken a question there and it says rising levels of overweight and obesity are placing an increasing burden on individuals. And then it's looking at our healthy weights for Ireland, which we've already looked at, and then your BMI. So you're 
given a, a graph like that and you're then asked to basically analyze it or ask questions on it. So I just picked out one part of that question and we will look at the graphs again. But this is the rate of obesity in Ireland has been increasing despite the fact that it's preventable. Outline five strategies to be considered when purchasing and preparing food in order to reduce sugar consumption. So five strategies at four marks each. So I'm just giving you the marking scheme here. All of this will be put into sentences and points, but can you just see one strategy on purchasing, one strategy on preparation, and then three others. So purchasing was fruit canned in juice rather than syrup, avoid cereals coated with sugar or honey, compare labels, choose foods that are lower in sugar, the traffic light system, etc. Preparing then, all right, replace sugar with pureed fruit, reduce the sugar in recipes, you know, no added sugar, fizzy drinks, you know, use water instead, etc. So I just wanted to give you an idea of these. Obviously, this is a marking scheme. So it's just the key words. You obviously would need to put these into um, sentences. OK, so again, um, there's quite a bit there now in that chapter two, guys. So before you come back to the next lectures make sure that you've all your worksheets done and that you've gone through the exam papers generally you will find these questions in question one and question two in section b and you will find a variation of them in section a so linking in with your exam papers now is really important um, in order to benefit from the intensity of this particular chapter so thanks again for watching um great academy's home economics lecture and i'll see you the next time and of course, as always, happy learning.